All right, I went and got a Blue Yeti microphone <laughs> because my sound was so bad. Um, so I think it's going to be better this time around. All right, so I'm finishing up the section, the second half of um, the Metaphysics of Quality section, section two of On Quality by Robert M. Persig. And we begin with... snippets from some letters and we begin with a with a passage from Lila an inquiry into morals the famous hot stove passage any person of any philosophic persuasion who sits on a hot stove will verify without any intellectual argument whatsoever that he is in an undeniably low quality situation that the value of his predicament is negative this low quality is not just a vague, woolly-headed, crypto-religious, metaphysical abstraction. It is an experience. It is not a judgment about an experience. It is not a mere description of an experience. The value itself is an experience. As such, it is completely predictable. So this first part of, of this um, paragraph is describing the quality event, which we've talked about, or I've talked about a lot on this channel. And that's that moment, that pre-intellectual awareness for, awareness for this particular person on the hot stove or um, of, low, of the low quality of this being a very unpleasant and painful situation, low quality. But that experience is a split second thing that happens. It's not something that, it is beyond the stove itself. And this is what he's gonna talk about. So to demonstrate that this is a real something that we can you know let's just say agree on the, that this is a real thing he goes through the scientific method a little bit it is verifiable by anyone who cares to do so it is reproducible of all experience it is the least ambiguous least mistakable there is later a person might generate some oaths to describe this low value but the value will always come first the oath second Without the primary low valuation, the secondary oaths will not follow. So um, it reminds me a little bit of when Jordan Peterson was trying to get to the bottom of his own reality and his, his own sort of metaphysical um, understanding. At the bottom of all reality for him is pain. And that's because everyone knows what pain is and it's unmistakable. But I'm going to argue a little bit that that's not really the case. We're not talking about pain. We're talking about valuation. Because there are some people who can't experience pain. So you can't say, well, every single circumstance, you know, that, that, that pain is the bottom of, that is low value. Because there are people, let's just say, in um, catatonic states who can't experience pain. There are people who um, don't have you know they have they have some kind of paralysis or they have some kind of nerve damage and they're going to sit on a hot stove and they're not going to feel it i think there's even some kind of um condition where you don't feel pain and that you don't live very long or you know you have to live in a bubble i suppose but while it's understood that but but so what i think what he was trying to get at jordan peterson and this is what person actually does get at is the valuation itself whether a wolf toward or away so the valuation itself is essential. You can't argue it. And that's why it's absolutely verifiable. Um, the reason for hammering on this so hard is that we have a culturally inherited blind spot here. Our culture teaches us to think it is the hot stove that directly causes the oaths. It teaches us that the low values are property of the of the person uttering the oaths. It's the value, it's the valuing, not so, it's the value between the stove and the oaths. And again, the hot stove may not produce the same 
low value in a person who cannot feel the stove. And a masochist might not utter oaths, right? <laughs> so what he's trying to say is this process behind all reality, this, this valuation quality itself, is beyond all content. It doesn't, uh, whatever it is in the world doesn't, doesn't possess quality. Quality is the relationship between the experiencer and what is experienced, I guess you could say. Between the subject and the object lies the value. This value is more immediate, more directly sensed than any self or any object to which it might later be assigned. It is more real than the stove. Whether the stove is the cause of the low quality or whether possibly something else is the cause is not yet absolutely certain, but the quality is low is absolutely certain. That's what's verifiable. That's what doesn't change. That's what is at the bottom of person's reality. It is the primary empirical reality from which such things as stoves and heat and oaths and selves are later intellectually constructed. So we have to identify them after the fact our, our our analogies that we create remember we create you know you have the quality event and then analogies are created and the analogy created is the oaths when it in terms of the reaction the reaction would be to jump off but the but our understanding of what just happened our intellectual our intel, is our intellectual patterns of value which is that's hot and I'm not sitting on that again. The reason values seem so woolly-headed to empiricists is that empiricists keep trying to assign them to subjects and objects. That's what we were talking about, trying to not see the bottom pattern of reality and, and um, say that it is this hot stove that causes the low value. Now, obviously, if you grew up in the subject-object world, which we all did, you can see how that happens. And this is exactly what he's trying to dispel. You can't do it. You get all mixed up because values don't belong to either group. They are a separate category of their own. That is extremely important. What the metaphysics quality would do is take the separate category, quality, and show how it contains within itself both subjects and objects. Experience, okay, this is a letter, uh, August 25th, 1998. Experience is pure quality, which gives rise to the creation of intellectual patterns that in turn produce a division between subjects and objects. So he's saying it right there. And now a beautiful sentence that says it all. Letter, December 19th, 1995. Quality selection creates the world. So God selects light out of darkness, right? Let's talk about the Pagellonian or Genesis, what we talk about in this corner. Um, there, there isn't anything, and then there is light. And that light is good, right? And that's the beginning of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Genesis, metaphysical quality, this is why I keep saying Persig is such a useful tool for understanding things in this little corner, even if he's not per se a religious person. Well, he's, he was a Zen guy, but, but I think that you're looking at something that is very um, consonant with Peugeot's language of creation in a lot of ways and with a lot of things that people talk about. I tried to show a little bit about and, and Jordan Peterson was much more Persergian in the past. Um, now he's off in a direction, uh, different direction, but it's, it's in his heart, I know. All right, Metaphysics of Quality Summary, Preparatory Notes for an Interview, 2005. Physicists have talked about a theory of everything. <laughs> You're going to love this. But it is only about everything composed of substance. Love, for example, is not included in a physicist's theory of everything. Neither is society or beauty or morality. In the, in the theory of everything, you know, whatever particle is way at the bottom of reality that we're finally going to discover, can build up into a neuron and that can, uh, that can ultimately give us love. <laughs> as long as substance is the basic material of reality, that particle, 
It has to stop when you get to things that have no scientific substance, such as love and society and beauty and morality. And that's because quality, let's just say morality in terms of social morality, is a social pattern of value. Let's just say society is an emergence from biology, from the biological level. It is something that biology has, that has emerged from biology, that is bigger than biology, but is supported by biology. And it's a new pattern, but it's a pattern of quality. So the emergence of these patterns after biology, when they become these um, not substance, non-substantial patterns is where a physical theory of everything isn't going to work. And that's probably why there has not been a theory of everything, because if you're leaving out the glue that creates reality, then you're going to have a very hard time having a theory of everything. All right, the next reading is, again, from that paper, Subjects, Objects, Data, and Values, 1999. Quality cannot be independently derived from either mind or matter, but it can be derived from the relationship of mind and matter with each other. Quality occurs at a point at which subject and object meet. Quality is not a thing. And, and notice how he says occurs. Quality is not a thing. It is an event. It is the event at which the subject becomes aware of the object. And, and awareness, the subject becomes aware of the object. Now, in Persig's metaphysics, awareness that he's using in this way, I think, means the determination of quality no matter at what level, um, at, at what level the determination occurs because these, these determinations of quality occur from the, they occur in the um, inorganic world. They occur in chemical reactions. This particle, this um, atom loves that atom and it makes a molecule. And the molecule is more complex and stronger and can do more. You know, the freedom that the two molecules have surpasses the freedom that each individual model, molecule uh, atom has. So there's an awareness that in order to, and, and <laughs> It opens up a can of worms when it comes to consciousness because does consciousness, does that mean that atoms are conscious? Well, that's a good question. You can read it one way or another. There is a type of consciousness that occurs at the moment that, and I think that this is important again to bring up again, when, when God says, let there be light, right? Which is the parallel we're using in, um, in, in, in biblical language of this, of this um, awareness, the subject being aware of the object, the, the evaluation. From that moment, light sort of means consciousness, and that means that from then on, um, as, as the world grows, develops, evolves, it does so with these quality events, and these events can be in this way of understanding possibly perceived to be conscious. So I guess it depends on how you use the word. I talked to, I remember at Thunder Bay, I asked Peja when consciousness began and um, begins, does it begin with, with this, you know, moment of, of light? And I think that he said, but this is a, you know, this is how we were understanding it. I, I think he said it begins with, um, you know, uh, it, it begins with, the Garden of Eden, of mankind becoming aware of himself. Quality is not a thing, it is an event. It is the event at which the subject becomes aware of the object. And because without objects, there can be no subject. Quality is the event. Does, do, you, do, you, do you hear what he's saying here? And because without objects, there can be no subject. There is nothing, if a tree falls <laughs> into the forest, you know, it's that same kind of thing. Without a contrast, without a valuing, how can something exist? And he's going to talk about this in the next reading. 
Quality is the event at which awareness of both subjects and objects is made possible. Quality is not just the result of a collision between subject and object. That is, a, you know, like a particle physicist might see it. This is a very, this is the very existence of subject and object themselves is deduced from the quality event, the awareness. The quality event is the cause of the subjects and objects, which are then mistakenly presumed to be the cause of quality. Lila, an inquiry into morals, 1991. This is another reading, and this is where he's going to talk about that. It's very interesting, and this is sort of um, reminds me of something Alan Watts said, although I'll talk about it in a second. The low value that can be derived from sitting on a hot stove is obviously an experience, even though it is not an object and even though it is not subjective. The low value comes first, and and then the subjective thoughts that include such things as stove and heat and pain come second. So that's going back to pain. Pain itself is an understanding of the actual low quality event. The value is the reality that brings the thoughts to mind. The value brings the understanding of what pain is to this person's, you know, hurting bottom because of this person's hurting bottom. <laughs> There's a principle in physics, very interesting. There's a principle in physics that if a thing can't be distinguished from anything else, it doesn't exist. To this, the metaphysics of quality adds a second principle. If a thing has no value, it isn't distinguished from anything else. Um, if a thing has no value, it isn't distinguished from anything else then putting the two together, a thing that has no value does not exist. The thing has not created the value. The value has created the thing. Um, in Alan Watts' KQED talks that he does, he, he has this, and this is in Eastern Understanding, which, you know, person had a lot of Eastern Understanding, that it is, he shows this, um, thing against a black background and you can't see it this black thing against a black background but when he pulls the black thing away into a white background then it becomes a thing then it becomes a black thing on the back background when it's on the black background you don't see it it doesn't exist and he was illustrating um i don't know what eastern concept but it sounds eastern doesn't it and it also sounds western it also sounds like the physics something you do in grade school to help you understand contrast, color, whatever. Um, so, so he's saying a thing that has no value does not exist. The problem of trying to describe value in terms of substance has been the problem of a smaller container trying to contain a larger one, which is why these theories of everything just don't work. Value is not a subspecies of substance. Substance is a subspecies of value. When you reverse the containment process and define substance in terms of value, the mystery disappears. Substance is a stable pattern of inorganic values. The problem then disappears. The world of objects and the world of values are unified. Unified. And the next is a letter, just one line, a letter, May 17th, 1993. I think quality is the fuel that, d that drives the struggle for survival. So remember when in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance he called gumption the psychic gasoline. I think that's an updated version of that. All right, letter, August 31st, 1995. Quality is a primary experience. It comes ahead of in intellect and metaphysics and therefore cannot be subordinated to any system of metaphysical classification. There is obviously an evolution. That, that's such a great way of, of understanding it because it means almost that, you know, if you're looking at, and in this corner we've sort of been looking at uh, Neoplatonism and religion itself and what it means going forward for us in a meaningful way. Well, if you're looking at the one or God in the sense of the, the orthodoxy, and maybe even, um, I, I'm, I'm following more of the orthodox stuff at this point, so that's what's in my head. Um, 
but there's that that sense that that God is something that is so beyond anything you could ever say or anything you could ever conceive. And I think that this is a very similar way of saying that, that it comes at, that there's, it can't be subordinated to any system of metaphysical classification. It, it kind of pierces through um, in some kind of way through consciousness, I suppose, from where we don't know where, and we never will know where, if you're trying to look for, you know, the origin of quality. And it, I'm, the point I'm trying to make is this is another reason why Persig's um, work is, is so useful in this corner and so useful for understanding um, so many things, including um, including God. <laughs> There is obviously an evolution. Okay, so I'm not sure what that means. Quality is a primary experience. It comes ahead of intellect and metaphysics and therefore cannot be subordinated to any system of metaphysical classification. There is obviously an evolution. Uh, I'm going to have to put a pin in that. Nothing has ever been discovered in the nature of the atom to suggest why this evolution should occur. All right, so there's obviously an evolution for us in our reality, in our universe, you know, the levels, etc., from the Big Bang, of supposedly, if that ever happened, to, uh, to now. Nothing has ever been discovered in the nature of the atom to suggest why this evolution should occur. No purposive teleological mechanism has been scientifically observed outside the atom to suggest why this evolution should occur. There's obviously value in the world. Although there is no value in the objective universe described by science, no scientific discovery could be made without a value judgment of what is important and what is not. If it can be shown that meaningfulness is a synonym for intellectual value, then it follows that a scientific procedure that contains no intellectual value judgment is meaningless. So, again, the things we're talking about, meaning being the primary, you know, one of the primary things we're talking about. Well, first of all, what I, what I was saying about, um, about, let's just say, quality piercing through the fabric of the universe from we know not where and we'll never know where. I, it's, he's kind of saying that in a way he's kind of saying that with this, um, with this understanding of something ineffable like that that you're never going to be able to have any kind of measuring or physicality to, you know, there's never going to be physicality to it. There's never going to be a way to measure it, but there's no doubt that it exists. And I think this, this um, quality is what makes meaning at all. In fact, that is meaning is valuing. In fact, when life is meaningless, you're not valuing. And in, in um, you've got that, that shut down state where the seeking system isn't working, which, and the seeking system is what takes you on the path of, of evaluating and, and, and determining what's good and what's better as you go finding whatever you're finding, because that's how we operate we, by finding. And that, that this, basically what he's saying is meaning and value are the same thing. So the next section is from Lila. And this is the metaphysics of quality in life, roughly, is what he's talking about here. Why should a group of simple, stable compounds of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen struggle for billions of years to organize themselves into a professor of chemistry? What's the motive? Natural selection is dynamic quality at work. All life is a migration of static patterns of quality toward dynamic quality. And that's um, toward what feels like is going to impart the most agency, what makes the organism in whatever simple or complex form feel free. What is that, uh, that quality stimulus? that makes the organism feel like, if you want to use the word feel, uh, perceive that the next move is going to be 
uh, impart more agency. So natural selection, what is natural selection? It's the, it's what is going to, what has more ability to survive, more agency, right? To the extent that one's behavior is controlled by static patterns of qualities without choice, but to the extent that one follows dynamic quality, which is undefinable, one's behavior is free. And that, that again, is, you know, wherever you are is where you are, and there's nothing you can do about that. And when I say you, I'm talking about anything in the universe right now, but in this particular um, section, they're talking about the biological level. Or, or he's talking about the biological, or they've compiled this section to um, illustrate his view of life, evolution, biological level. So this is toward, again, um, there you are, you're stuck, wherever you are, but you can sense, it can sense, <laughs> That's, that sense of quality is imparting on the biological organism. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. That sense of quality is imparting... It, the, the, the biological organism has a sense of betterness. And this isn't the betterness that's necessarily... The betterness in the way we see it is an intellectual betterness. We used to come here. Oh. That cat knows that um, by cozying up to me, she's more likely to get fed dynamic quality. And so that's going to, um, I forgot, I lost my train of thought. Not just life, but everything is an ethical activity. And remember that when Persig is talking about ethics and morals. He's not necessarily talking about social level ethics and morals, which is the only thing we ever think about uh, when we hear the word ethical. He's talking about what's better for whatever. When organic, inorganic patterns of reality create life, the metaphysics of quality postulates they've done this because it's better. And that this definition of betterness, this beginning response to dynamic quality, is an elementary unit, elementary unit of ethics upon which all right and wrong can be based. So case in point, even in our own ethical system, in our social morality, life is better than death, right? So the ethics underlie that main tenet of our own morality, which is life is better than death. That's the bottom of our, our ethics. And um, DQ, you know, dynamic quality means a liberation of some sort. It means moving in a direction. Remember what, what, um, what uh, <laughs> Peterson said, the unbearable now, the uh, perceived future, you know, that egg uh, map. That's that same thing. The next thing you want to do is going to relieve whatever is uh, needs to be relieved. And sometimes nothing needs to be relieved, so you choose not to do the thing. The quality thing is to stay static, to stay in stasis. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. So let's... Uh, I think I have a couple more things to say about this because this really is an important section. It, it although it's about life, it really involves uh, a lot. You know, the fact of the matter is that these these layers, um, these these uh, evolutionary layers, are an ethical and moral progression, which is why you end up ultimately. Um, needing to defer to the upper level as a moral decision. And even if you look at that ethically in terms of social morality, the higher level, if you defer to the higher level in general, that's the right decision. Like choosing the life of a person over the life of an animal, let's say. Although a lot of people would not agree with that. All right, so the next one is a letter, March 29th, 1997. The universe is evolving from a condition of low quality, quantum forces only, no atoms, pre-Big Bang, toward a higher one, birds, trees, societies, and thoughts, and in a static sense, the world of everyday affairs. These two are not the same. Does this not remind you of Genesis? 
from this scientifically described quantum forces only no atoms pre big bang to the manifestation of, of um, life sounds like Genesis and I think that's a sort of a scientific description of Genesis so you've got you've got darkness and then you have manifestation and the manifestation in the metaphysical quality is a higher quality so the next one is from Lila again. Uh, when a person who sits on the stove first discovers his low quality situation, the front edge of his experience is dynamic. He does not think this stove is hot and then make a rational decision to get off. A dim perception of he knows not what, in quotation marks, and uh, uh, that is referring to something that uh, Fiedrich read in Lila, gets him off dynamically. Later he generates static patterns of thought to explain the situation. So that's just a reiteration of that very good example of the hot stove. Letter, August 9th, 1995. Although it is culturally assumed that the subject-object interaction gives a rise to value, a more comprehensive metaphysics is possible when one says that it is the value that gives rise to any observation. The value precedes the observation, creates the observation, that in turn creates the thing observed. Thus value is not a property of an electron. An electron is a pattern of values. And this totally makes sense when you realize that value is pre-intellectual, you know, that it is, um, it actually is spontaneously hits and then whatever is perceived, you know, whatever object or situation or, or um, whatever situation object is perceived based on that pre-intellectual value. So, and an and electron, like in regular physics and science, an electron is perceived to be a static, fixed thing that has always been there and always will be there. But in other metaphysics, the electron is a phenomenon. So that's a big difference. The next section is from Lila again. In a subject-object metaphysics, morals and art are worlds apart. Morals being concerned with the subject quality and art with the, with the object quality. But in the metaphysics quality, that division doesn't exist. They're the same. Which makes metaphysics quality a unified theory, and it really is. It's saying that everything shares the same origin and exists in the world because of the same reason, which is value, which is quality. And I think that that's something really worth considering when you think about unified theories, which really are only trying to unify one level, which is the inorganic level. Physics is only about the inorganic level of value. The metaphysics of quality is about everything. All right, the next section is from a lecture sponsored by the Association for Humanistic Psychology Conference, July 1992, San Diego State University. And I guess he was um, felt obligated to give a lecture right around the time of Lila. He gave very few lectures. Um, I do have one. There is one, if you look up Ted Persig, his son, he's posted a lecture from 1974, which is very interesting. It's about the artistic process, <laughs> the writing process, uh, among other things. All right, so in this lecture, he says, the purpose of each person's life is not just self-gratification. It has a much larger moral purpose, but by this is not meant some narrow-minded Victorian social restraint. A person should contribute to the quality of the world. Now, who can argue with that? And that means that whatever, whatever you see as moral, which isn't necessarily what society sees as moral, you should, you should do your best to honestly and authentically connect with quality. This is not unlike what Jordan Peterson says about the truth that you know what it is, you know, you know when you're fooling yourself, if you really listen, listen, you know when you're fooling yourself and, and you shouldn't do that, and you shouldn't lie. Very similar, and I've, I've said that before. 
All right, the next one is very interesting in this little corner because it's about God. <laughs> Quality can be equated with God, but I don't like to do, to do so. God, to most people, is a set of static intellectual and social patterns, which is why he doesn't want to do that. Only true religious mystics can correctly equate God with dynamic quality. In the West, particularly around universities, these people are quite rare. The others who go around saying God wants this or God will answer your prayers are, in according to the metaphysics of quality, engaging in a minor form of evil. Such statements are a lower form of evolution, intellectual patterns attempting to contain a higher one, dynamic quality. And that is what evil is. Uh, roughly in the metaphysics of quality is when you try to contain a higher pattern with the lower one. Sometimes that's not the case. If the higher pattern is too rigid or too dynamic, the lower pattern needs to rein it in. So there's a vertical, um, harmonious, and I, I'm, I'm actually going to go into this in a minute. Um, I'm going to go into that in a minute. All right, so there you go. A person should contribute to the quality of the world. Now, how can you argue with that? And and um, and how does this not figure into the notion of God, right? So connecting with dynamic to the best of your ability allows you to contribute to the quality of the world. This next session is very interesting. To me, happiness is a much narrower term than quality. I think, hap I think of happiness as a, a biological response to quality, in which the quality is external, objective, and the happiness is internal, subjective. Happiness is thus subordinate to a subject-object metaphysical relationship and is limited by it. All the philosophical ethics systems I've read are like this, inside a subject-object prison. So when, when, when you're reliant on an established static pattern, let's just say an outside, for, if you're reliant on an outside circumstance for an inside good feeling, this requires the outside in the, to line up in order for the inside to be good, and that's a big problem in, in therapy, too. Ethics are, a, are set standards, not a system. They are, they are a list of, of standards that you're supposed to adhere to, whereas metaphysics quality is a system that allows you to do the most high-quality thing that... Um, that you can't, like we were talking about before. It's not a goal of being good. It's a system in which you harness the highest quality. When discussing the metaphysics of quality, the greatest difficulty you will have is keeping people accustomed, keeping people accustomed to subject-object habits of thought from trying to put your statements inside this prison. And so there really needs to be a reframe in order, if there were a reframe, I think we'd do a lot better if we were able to reframe the way we see reality in terms of this metaphysics, which is, of course, what person was trying to do. All right, the next one is a letter, December 24th, 1995. I used to give students the advice. First, you see what has quality, then you figure out why. And that, I think, seeing what has quality, I, th I think I'd bring in the word intuition into this discussion because I think that using intuition, like we were talking about truth, you know, you know, just listen to your intuition, you're roughly going to go with the next best move is, even if there's a dilemma, even if you're going back and forth, that going back and forth is also a quality decision because it means you're not too sure and not being too sure or not making a rash judgment is also a quality decision. Sometimes you need to make a quick judgment. That's a quality decision. But the point I'm making is, is you go with quality first and then figure out why. Don't reverse the process or you will get all confused. In the West since Aristotle, the central, the central reality of understanding has, e has been either the mind of God or else substance. In the East, the Hindus say that the central reality is oneness, 
the Buddhists say it is nothingness. That's quite a difference when one considers that they both mean the same thing. At that level, terms lose, terms lose their meaning. Oneness is one intellectual path up the mountain of understanding. Nothingness is another such path. Quality is a third. When a scientifically oriented mind hears the term substance, it says that's reality. When it hears about oneness and nothingness, it says that's just empty, meaningless, metaphysical claptrap for the mind of God which we have already rejected for empirical reasons. Scientifically, those words have no meaning. The term quality is superior to oneness and nothingness because it is impossible for scientists to reject it as metaphysical religious crap trap. They try, but they cannot get away with saying there is no, there are no values in the world. And that's very true because, um, again, the metaphysical quality bridges the gap between science and religion because it points out that both science and religion are operating in the same system towards what's better. And um, that was very much, you know, that was the, the, the essential problem then in the art of motorcycle maintenance was bridging dynamic and static quality. I mean, uh, romantic and classic, right? So that has always been this, what the metaphysics of quality and person attempt to do is show that these things that we think are so different, art and science, art and religion, are in fact variations of the same thing. So the next one is a letter, um, December 24th, 1992. That's interesting. December 24th also. Quality is used in Lila because Sarah Vinke started the train of thought that that way in Bozeman, Montana, as recorded in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Value is a more customary philosophic term. Again, it bridges the gap better, or reframes better. And this is very, this is probably the passage that speaks to our little corner <laughs> more than any passage in this book. Letter, November 11th, 2004. As far as I know, quality is still the best term, but meaning is a term I have thought about often. It's an excellent synonym for quality at the intellectual level, and I think it represents the first stage of the transition from dynamic quality to intellectual patterns. And I want to say that the transition of dynamic quality to intellectual patterns, I think the word logos is a way of describing that, that uh, transition. I think like the pre-intellectual into intellectual or pre-intellectual into perceived quality that's logos that that um, function that's the function of logos one first sense uh, senses that some new experience is meaningful and then because of that sense tries to understand it that is contain it within existing intellectual or mathematical patterns at lower levels however particularly at the inorganic level, the term meaning is not at all as useful since it is quite awkward to say that hydrogen combines with oxygen because it finds it meaningful to do so. I don't know. I don't find that awkward. <laughs> I think that means something to me. <laughs> That's meaningful. At the biological level, one does not scratch an itch because it, ha it is meaningful, but rather because it is biological value valuable because it feels better. Okay, so the next one is a letter... Di um, December 24th again 19 oh that's the same letter uh, that's the same letter 1995 the metaphysics of quality is valuable because it provides a central pivotal pivotal term that the western scientifically structured mind cannot dismiss this, these are all the reasons why the metaphysics of quality is a great philosophical system one it provides a central pivotal term that the Western scientifically structured mind cannot dismiss. The second reason, too, for the selection of quality as a pivotal term is that it solves the two world problems of C.P. Snow. I don't know who that is. The division between the arts and sciences. We've already talked about that. The third is that it solves the mind matter problem. And that's when, um, that's the, intellectual value has evolved from 
or an inorganic value, but not in the way, not not as if, it, but it isn't an organic value because a, a substance-oriented metaphysics will say, well, down there in the chemicals, you're going to see why we, you know, have have all the have all the um, inorganic basis of why we have these thoughts and stuff, and it's a direct lineage. It's not in the metaphysics of quality. It's this whole separate thing at the intellectual level. However, it is ratcheted off from matter. It is quality. Mind and matter are both um, their origin and their evolution is in quality. The fourth is that it solves the scientific religion problem. We've already talked about that. That atoms are static patterns of quality means that atoms can be static patterns of God without losing any of their empirical objectivity. The fifth is that it solves the aesthetic problem as shown in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. The aesthetics problem meaning, I think, that the beauty of doing motorcycle maintenance well is equivalent to the beauty of nature. That, that quality, if quality is present in something, even if, even if it's technology or a work of art, if quality is present, then it is beautiful, and the aesthetics are, you know, that, is, that solves the aesthetic problem. The sixth is that it solves the moral problem, as shown in Lila. There are many other problems solved by it, the metaphysics of quality, but any of the above seems to justify it as a major philosophical system that it solves all of them simultaneously makes it of unqualified magnitude. And let's sum it up with this little thing. This isn't the last section, but it is a good summary. Letter, October 30th, 1998. Reality isn't in the mind or in the external world. It is in the values that create both the quality event. Letter, September 11th, 1994. All objects, whether they move or not, are physical patterns of value and therefore are static patterns of quality. Static and dynamic are not properties of objects. Objects are a property of static quality. Dynamic quality is independent of all objects. It is not any kind of pattern. Not physical, not biological, not social, and most important for you, not intellectual. The uh, letter to someone, you know, who probably was mulling over these things in an intellectual or philosophical way. But I think that this is a great, and I'm going to read it again, a great under, way to understand dynamic quality. Dynamic quality is independent of all objects. It is not any kind of pattern, not physical, not biological, not social, and not intellectual. So that is kind of like the spirit or the, the, um, the driving force, you know, again, spirit, force, these things. Uh, the breath of God, you know, let's just say the Tao, this puts quality, this this is a way of, di of describing dynamic quality in that domain. It is, it is what propels anything to even be at all. Dynamic quality is outside all patterns, including philosophical rules, when perceived directly without intellectual mediation. And we've seen this mystical understanding in every single religion. The direct perception of pure dynamic quality without any intellectual mediation is the same as the goal of Buddhism known as awakening or enlightenment. To see more clearly why this is so, I recommend that you read Eugene Harrigal's Zen in the Art of Archery, from which the title of my book was taken. There, if you substitute the Zen master's it for dynamic quality, you will learn a lot about dynamic quality. Well, I think probably I need to move on and maybe read that and do a little commentary on Zen in the Art of Archery. Why not? And the last letter, the last passage in the section is a short as a sentence from a letter. February 1998. Every time you discover for the first time that something is better than something else, that is where dynamic quality exists. There is no fixed static location for it. So that's why this book is so good when it comes to understanding Persick's work. It's just full of gems like that. Now, can you, can this help you, can this help us understand the metaphysics of quality easily? Every time you discover for the first time something is better than something else. That's where dynamic quality exists. There's no fixed location. 
So that is that section. We've got a couple more coming up, and then that'll be the end of the book. So I hope that that made sense, and I'll see you next time.